As I said from the title slide, my name is Gary Short, and um, this session is going to be from Zero Hadoop on the MS Dev Stack. Right now, I'm not, I'm not sure if it was particularly clear from the abstract that this was going to be on the MS Dev Stack. So if anybody is unimpressed by that and expecting to see lots of Java or lots of Python or stuff like that, then now would be a good time to go and see someone else. Okay, that's it. Nobody moves. That's it. See, so that's it. You're trapped now. You had your chance. You're trapped now. Okay, so quick introduction. This is me. Uh, my name is Gary Short. As I said before, uh, I'm a Microsoft um, C Sharp MVP. So all of the code in this demo is going to be C Sharp. Anybody here scared of seeing C Sharp code? Just a couple of you. All right. Those of you who are not scared, you haven't seen my code yet. All right. It's guaranteed to scare anybody. All right. The C Sharp code is not particularly in depth. It's not particularly clever or tight or you know um, scary in any way. Um, we'll walk through it. It's probably very straightforward. The couple of you who did put your hands up about mm, not sure about C sharp, what um, programming languages do you program in? C in C sharp, and you're still you still don't want to see it. It's like it's because I'm a C sharp programmer. I don't want to see any C sharp. It's, fair enough. Fair enough. Java. And you're a Java programmer. Excellent. Okay, so I hope to convert you then um, to C sharp. Um, you know you're using the wrong programming language when it's when the best programming language for the for the Java virtual machine is never Java, right? There is always something better to program in. Yeah, it's, it's something religious about that question. So. <laughs> <laughs> t t t would I ever start a fight? Would I start a fight about Java? Yeah. Never. <laughs> well, it, it is. It's kind of it's what Java should have been if it was written properly. Um, <laughs> basically, Microsoft looked at it. Microsoft looked at it. Like, we know what you meant, right? Here you go. <laughs> okay, joking aside. Um, so I am a, a big data architect um, and engineer, um, working mostly in, in Hadoop, um, uh, HD Insight, and writing things like Pig and Hive and, and stuff like that. Although we won't be seeing any Pig and Hive um, syntax today because I don't want to get into the syntax, although I will show you there's a brief uh, there's a brief point where I actually show you how to run some C-sharp code, and at that point, I'll show you how to run the equivalent in Pig in that, or in Hive, if that's what you prefer to do. Um, anybody here written any Hive before? Any Pig stuff? So the fact I'm not going to show you any of that isn't going to be a huge problem to you. Okay. Mainly my interests are in um, predictive analytics and computational linguistics and that kind of stuff. I ran a day here yesterday, I'd see a couple of faces here recognized. I ran a day here yesterday on data science and that kind of stuff, and that's what we were looking at. Um, if you want to get a hold of me after the talk um, to ask her any questions or anything that's um, anything that you've thought of on the way home or when you're in the bar at night drinking beer, you suddenly thought, oh, I must ask Gary that, because it happens all the time, right, when you're in the bar. When you're in the bar, you know, say, ah, oh, I must ask this technical question. But if that, if that uh, crops up, you can get a hold of me there on my email address and on Twitter. I think people are on Twitter most days. Uh, most people are on Twitter these days is, is what I mean. Not people are on Twitter most days. Uh, although that's probably true as well. Uh, as I've said to people earlier, and I've said before, if you do have a question to ask, then the best place to ask it is on Twitter. Okay? You're much more likely to get an answer from me if your question is constrained to 140 characters. Okay? If you send me screens of email and a question, you'll probably still get an answer. You just won't like it. That's all. Okay. So quickly, what we're going to look uh, what we're going to look at today is I'm going to have a quick look at the problem that Hadoop solves. Um, not just that launch into Hadoop and all the rest of it. I'm going to show you what what the problem is that it actually solves and why it came about. Then I'm going to show you how to get it installed on your laptops or your dev machines. Um, and then show you how to get your C sharp code running. So it's a nice, it's a nice kind of primer for Microsoft Dev Stack people. On you know, I'm already a developer. I can already write C sharp. If you look at the documentation um, around Hadoop, you can be forgiven for thinking that it's basically a, a Linux or or Mac um, Java dominated um, universe. And it pretty much is. To be fair, it is kind of dominated by the by the Java programming and the GVM languages, but. Um, you absolutely can program for that environment if you're a C-sharp or, or a VB.NET program. Any VB.NET programmers in here? Okay, a couple. There will be, I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Um, so you absolutely can. If you are a, uh, basically everything that I'm going to show you is is totally applicable to the VB.NET world, and um, just in a different syntax. Um, but basically today is to show you that uh, Hadoop isn't a, it isn't only a, a Java Linux um, environment. You absolutely can program on, on it if you are in the in the Microsoft Dev stack. And then we'll have a look. Um, Moving slightly away from Hadoop, I mean, obviously there's still be a, a, a Hadoop side to it. I'm going to show you how to do that. Um, it's how do you visualize your results after you've done all this wonderful stuff on Hadoop? I mean, at the end of the day, what you'll end up with once you run your stuff on Hadoop is, in a, res is a result set on Hadoop. Well, what are you going to do with it then? Um, you can't really come to your manager and go, well, I've done this brilliant piece of statistics. Here's a CSV file that shows you exactly what I mean. That isn't any use to you. So we're going to have a quick look at, at how you can um, use some of the standard um, Microsoft tools um, to actually visualize the results of your Hadoop jobs. And then I'll take questions. I say I'll take questions. It has to appear somewhere on the agenda, but just because it's in the last doesn't mean to say um, you know you have to keep all your questions to the end. There will be time at the end unless I overrun, in which case there won't. And I've got pre-cons for doing that, so who knows? Um, so always best to ask your questions um, when they actually arise. There's two reasons for that. One, as I said, I've got pre-cons for overrunning, so there may not be time for questions at the end. And two, it's always better if you've got a question about a slide that I've got or a piece of code to actually ask it while the code's up instead of having me spend five minutes mm -hmm. embarrassingly trying to find the slide that you were talking about. Right? Some people say, oh, don't ask, don't ask questions till the end because I might answer your question on the very next slide. Right? I don't mind that. I look like a freaking genius. Right? If you ask me a question and I go, ha-ha, Click, there's the answer to your question, right? So I love that kind of thing. So ask questions as and when they come up. All right, so that's basically enough waffly talk um, for the time being. Let's have a, let's have a quick demo. <coughs> let's look at the problem that Hadoop actually sets out to solve. So if we grab one of these, that will do. Here's a problem. For some reason, and to be honest, I have absolutely no idea why, the canonical example for MapReduce and for um, Hadoop is the, I know it's not the, the optimal resolution, I don't care, go away. For some reason that nobody really knows, the canonical example for Hadoop and MapReduce is word count. Um, I have no idea why. I didn't realize there was a, a great need uh, in industry these days for, for words to be counted. But apparently, um, it's, it's the be all and end all of the Hadoop world. So we're just gonna follow along we're going to follow along with that, um, with that kind of canonical example for the time being, basically so that the demo gods don't smite me. I mean, you know if you're writing any kind of introduction to programming, a programming language talk, it doesn't matter what programming language it is, you have to write the hello world example. And if you do not write the hello world example, then the demo gods will smite you, and none of your other examples will work for the rest of your talk. It's the same with this, okay? If we don't start with the canonical word count example, then none of the other examples will work. That's just the rules. So here we have, here we have a, a word count example which shows the problem that Hadoop sets out to solve. So we've got a string here with a number of words, and you can see what I've done, because I've got very little imagination. I've got one word one, two word twos, three word threes, and four word fours, okay? Just so it makes it easier to realize that the word count algorithm did actually do counting words. And what I do then, it's a very simple algorithm, what I do is I split it up on the comma, I then group by the actual words themselves, I change it to a two list just to satisfy the compiler, um, and then I use the for each uh, function um, on each of the group to write out how many times each of the word appears. Okay, so I use the key there for the actual word and the count for, um, to count how many, of, how many times the word appears. Okay, so very simple algorithm, and if I run that now, we should be able to see it works. Excellent. Can you guys at the back read that? Is that big enough for you? Yeah, and then, excellent, superb. All right, so we can see there that um, the word one appears one time, the word two appears two times, three appears three times, and four appears four times. So, wahoo, that works. <coughs> Let's just get rid of this now. So, what kind of issues are we gonna have with scalability with that algorithm? <coughs> It's no, it's after lunch. I'm here to be taught. I am will not engage. If I wanted to answer questions, I would not come to a conference. Large arrays of words? Yes, exactly. So one of the, one of the issues we're going to have is that you, you can see that the entire um, input that has to be counted is read into memory. Um, so obviously, we are going to be at some point memory constrained. Okay, there are going to become a point where we don't have enough RAM on our machine to actually physically load the, the, the big data that we're trying to count into memory. 
right? Now there's, there's ways around that. What, what could we do to um, solve that problem? We can stream it, right? So instead of reading the entire file into memory at once, we could stream the actual just, um, we could stream like one line at a time, process one line at a time. And then of course, it wouldn't matter how big the file was because we're only working with one line at a time. All right, so what kind of, what's going to constrain us there? Why is that not a solution going forward? We can't infinitely do that. Oh, the result set. So there's two, absolutely, there's two reasons. One is the size of the result set, as the gentleman correctly said. You know, at some point, the result set itself may actually then um, become bigger than the memory available in the machine. And the other thing is we could be what's called CPU bound. Um, in other words, we might not be able to run one line at a time and do the calculation in enough time to actually give us the answer in any meaningful kind of time. If I give you terabytes of data and you say, well, that's fine, come back in an hour, that's not any use to me. Okay, I want, I want the answer as quickly as possible. So this algorithm is both memory bound and CPU bound. Okay, so what is the solution to, what is the solution to that? So the solution to that is, and it's been known for quite some time, is MapReduce, okay? And what happens is MapReduce is, is very basically where you take the input from a file, so say it's a line, and you map a function to every line in the file. What that basically means is for every line in the file, you run a function across it, okay? And that map will output um, a, a key value pair for every line in that, in that file. And then what will happen is we take a we then take a reduce and a reduce function actually reduces all of those um, key value pairs down to one summary key value pair. Okay, it's quite difficult to explain in abstract, so I'll give you an example here using that same word count algorithm, but we'll break it down into a map reduce. <clears throat> so first of all, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to swap that over and make that the startup solution. So what I've got here is I've got I want to run a map function and then run a reduce on the output of the map function, and the map function will take the exact same string as we had before. Okay, so if we go down here, first of all, we look at the map. The map takes the input, and what it does is, it takes that input, and what it does is look, and you can see that this algorithm is practically the same. Okay, so we're gonna split it up on commas, we're gonna turn it into a two list to satisfy the compiler again, and then we're gonna use this for each loop just exactly the same as we did before. Except this time, what we're going to do is we're going to, to create um, a key value pair where, um, in this case, we're actually doing it as a tuple, but it's still a, a key value, where the first item in the tuple is going to be the key, it's going to be the actual word that we send out, and the value is going to be one. So basically what this map function is doing is it's taking the string input from the file, okay, and for every word it sees, it says, I've seen that word one time, I've seen that word one time, I've seen that word one time, I've seen that word one time. Okay, so that's our map function. Down here a little bit, we've got our reduce. And what's going to happen is the reduce is going to get that list from the, it's going to get the, the output from the map function. And what we're here we're going to do is we're going to group by the key. Okay, so we're going to get a group for each of the words. All right. And then again, we're going to turn that group to a to list. Then we're going to for each over that. And then for each group, we say we're going to, output the key, and we're going to output the count. All right, so the map function is going to go, I've seen that word once, I've seen that word once, I've seen that word once. And the reducer is going to get, I'm going to get the word, so for example, the, and it's going to get the, followed by one, 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 for every time it sees the one, okay? And then what it's going to do is it's going to reduce that down, and it's going to count up how many times that appears, and then we're going to output the and four, for example. Okay, so that's all that that is going to do. So let me just run that now, and the output should be the same. Yay! Okay, so although we have split the algorithm up into two parts now, map and reduce, it still does the same thing. All right, and the algorithm internally, when you, if you look at the function, the map function, the algorithm wasn't actually that different from how we how we implemented it in the first place. Okay, so now what we can do, now that we've split that up into map and reduce, what we can say is we can use commodity servers, okay, and we can load our map and reduce function onto these servers. So now we're no longer um, constrained by memory or by CPU. 
Because if somebody comes along and says, well, here's an input file, we say, well, that's fine. Here's our mapper, here's our reduce servers. And somebody says, oh, well, what happens if that file is twice as big as it was the last time? We say, well, that's fine. I'll just use twice the number of servers. But what happens if it doubles again? Well, I'll double again. Okay, and now we've solved that problem because it doesn't matter how big that file is now, we can just keep doubling the number of servers that we're using. And because they're commodity servers, that's going to be pretty cheap to do. All right? And that is the space that, is the space that MapReduce solves. Okay? Not Hadoop itself, we'll talk about Hadoop specifically in a minute, but that is the, that's the whole problem that the MapReduce um, universe sets out to um, solve. So how much, how big can you scale it to? Well, MapReduce is a kind of engine that runs the indexing on the internet. Okay? It's something that came out of Google. They, they're kind of moving away from that to a certain extent now, but for a great number of years, that is how Google indexed the internet. So if they can use MapReduce to index the internet, okay, I'm pretty sure that we can use MapReduce to overcome any kind of scalability problems that we're going to have okay, in, our, in our business. <clears throat> All right, so let's get back to the slides. Okay, we haven't actually solved this problem now, right? All we've actually done is swap one set of problems, i.e. scalability, for another set of problems. And those problems that we've got right now is, well, okay, we've now got the ability to split up an input into lots of different slices and put those inputs out onto different servers and then to load our map and reduce functions onto those servers, okay, and deal with all of that kind of stuff. But what that means is all of that is now on us. We've got all of those problems to deal with. Right, splitting up the file, that's our problem. Making sure the right function is on the right server with the right data, that's our problem to solve. Okay? If you're on a data center, if you're in a data center, right, so the mean, the, the mean time between failures for hard drives, for example, is about three years. Okay? So, there's about a, it's about, so there's about a one in a thousand chance on any given day that when you turn on your laptop, the hard drive is going to go. Well, that's okay, I can live with that. You know, it's a one in a thousand chance. The, the hard drive will last about three years. But if you work in a data center with a thousand node cluster, and the chances of your hard drive failing are one in a thousand, and you've got a thousand servers, you're pretty much guaranteed that a hard drive is gonna fail at least once a day, okay? And that failure is down to you to solve as well. If you've broken up that piece of a file and you've put it onto a server with a map or a reduced function, and then that hard drive fails, well, you, you've got missing data. You've got, you've got to deal with that. Right? So now, actually, our solution to a problem seems to have given us a hell of a lot more problems to solve. Okay? And that's where Hadoop comes in. All right? MapReduce is the solution to our scalability problem, and Hadoop is a framework which is a solution to all of that other stuff that comes along with our MapReduce. Okay? And this is a good diagram that basically shows you how Hadoop works. Okay? So up here, in this box here is all of our commodity nodes that I was telling you about. N number, it doesn't matter, how many, however many you want. If it's not going fast enough, then double the size of it. Okay, how fast do you want to go? This can be any number. Up here is the name node. Okay, and the name node is responsible for knowing where all of these servers are, which of these servers are all working, which of them have failed, okay, what job is on what server, and what data is on what server. Okay. So how you interact with it is you're over here and you've got the data. So say it's a CSV file. And what you're going to do is you're going to pass that CSV file to the name node here and you're going to say, please store that file for me. And the name node's going to go, yes, no problem. And by default, you can change this, but by default what it's going to do is it's going to break that file up into 64 megabyte chunks. And it's going to store that 64 megabyte chunk one time and it's going to replicate it twice. All right? So it's going to store it one time on one of these servers. It's going to replicate it, and the first time it replicates it, it's going to store it on a server within that cabinet. All right? And what that means is, if you get a hard drive failure on that server, the one right next to it in the same cabinet is going to have a copy of that data, so it's just going to go. And the second time it replicates it, it's going to replicate it in a server in a second cabinet. So now we have we have actual node redundancy, so if we lose a node, we're still covered. And we've also got cabinet redundancy, so if we lose an entire cabinet, we've still got redundancy here because it's, it's copied there. All right? And so that's how, we get, that's how we get around the problem of data integrity. You know, the what happens if we have a hard drive failure issue? It doesn't matter. Hadoop is going to solve that problem for us. Okay? How do you interact with it? You interact with it over here. 
So it doesn't matter whether you're writing C-sharp or PEG or Hive, it doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, um, something is going to break down the code that you write into a set of MapReduce jobs. Okay? Those MapReduce jobs are going to get given to the name node. Okay? The name node, which can be the job tracker or the job tracker can be a separate um, node, it doesn't really matter. But what that's going to do is, that is going to manage the running of the map function against the 64 megabyte chunk of data that's right on the server. All right. So now, it's, now that gives us two things. One, it's going to be really fast because the data and the code operating on that data are right there on the hard drive together. Okay. We're not hauling data across the network. All right. And the second thing is we can use commodity machines. All right. We don't need big fancy servers because all we're asking the server to do okay, is to load 64 megabytes of, of data into its memory and run an application on it. All right. So it doesn't have to be a big beefy server. Okay. They can be cheap low-cost commodity servers. And what's going to happen is that's going to, whoops, that's going to run the jobs and you are going to get your answer back. Okay, so how does it actually run the jobs? So it works like this. Here is our, here is our nodes, nodes one, two, and three, and these are mapping nodes just now. And what they're doing is they're doing, just, just as I showed you in the in example, they are mapping a function to every line of output in that 64 megabytes they've got. And what they're doing is they are then um, emitting out a key value. Right? It doesn't really matter what's in the key and what's in the value. Okay? They, they emit a key value pair. We then get this part here, which is called the Hadoop shuffle. All right? And what happens is there's a little bit of optimization goes on here. So if this server actually chucks out, um, say, we're, say we're talking about words, okay? we're, we're, still, we're still on um, word count and it chucks out a the one time. Well, the next time it sees then it chucks out the one time, that's going to get optimized on this part here as part of the shuffle. It's just going to add those, aggregate them all together so that all the words are already aggregated um, as much as they can be on each of the nodes. Okay? <coughs> Thereafter, what's going to happen is a set of reducers down here, and what they're going to do is they're going to reduce down all of the counts for the word the, for example, into one summary, into one aggregate. So what's going to happen is all of the, all of the words the, for example, from this server and from this server and from this server are going to get sent here to this reducer, and this reducer is going to deal with that. All right. So all of the mapping output with the same key gets sent to the same server. All right. And there's the first issue, in as much as you have to be careful in how you're writing your map reduce code, because what is the fastest way then, given that information, what's the fastest way of bringing an Hadoop cluster to its knees? If I say to you, I've got a thousand nodes in my cluster here, okay, and then I say to you that all of the mapping output with the same key will get sent to the same server, what's the issue there? What do I have to be careful of? Just yes, sir. Three. If the data is skewed, you don't get everything going to one. The exactly. That's exactly right. So what the gentleman said there was you've got to be basically you've got to be you've got to be careful of universal keys or or skewed keys if you've got an, an imbalance, right? So if I've got a universal key, because that example is is easier to explain, if I've got a universal key, every single output from every single mapper will be sent to the one reducer. All right? And I'll have one reducer spinning its wheels with its CPU at red and its memory consumption at red and nine hundred and ninety-nine <coughs> nodes there all sitting doing nothing, wondering what's happened to the world. Okay? Don't do that kind of thing because your Hadoop administrator will hate you. Right? So are you yes. saying that the more variance there is in input data, the better performance that you're supposed to perform? So that's exactly what I'm saying. So the, the, question was, the question was there. So basically, it, you try to spread as much as you can the, uh, I mean obviously, you try to spread as much as you can the key between the servers. Obviously, there's a limit to how, how much you can do that. I mean, if you are doing a word count, for example, that's pretty straightforward. You know, the, the, there is a frequency of words in the English language. Does anybody know which um, word in the English language appears most often? Everybody says the. Uh, I think that's second, right? It's actually I. I is the most commonly used word in the English language, right? Because we're all megalomaniacs, right? We're all egotistical um, narcissists. I is the most common. But yeah, so, uh, and there's up there. But there is a natural frequency distribution. Um, of words, and, and that in itself is fine, you know. But if you're doing if you're doing customers and they're all Adam, you know, then that's all going to go to the one. It's all going to go to the one um, server. Okay. Yes, sir. Are there any different uh, kinds of scheduling algorithms available? 
Uh, not so much. There, there are, there is, there is smart stuff that will happen in there that will, that will um, try to balance out the the um, reducers as, as much as they possibly can. You know, to, um, but you've got to play your part to help. You know, you've got to be careful. I'm, I'm not saying you know you have to sit there and totally do micro optimizations on your key value pair. I'm just saying be careful that you don't create um, highly skewed keys, and definitely you don't have a. You don't have a you know a global key where you just say well everything is going to be mapped to this key, all right? You have to be careful for that kind of thing. But yeah, there are smarts within Hadoop that will kind of help you out. Yes, sir. So if you do have skewed data, <coughs> then what and you can actually control which nodes they get sent to. How do you then optimize that? Because that's your data. You've got a whole data of items in there. So there's a, there's a number of things that you can do. Um, so the question there was, well, well, what do you do if your data is skewed? Um, so one of the things that you can actually do is to partition it on the key itself. So if we're not, I don't want to get into the administration of Hadoop, right? Because that gets that gets deep and and it gets it gets confusing. Not confusing. It gets complicated really quickly, right? But apart from anything else, I want to stick to the developer story, right? So if we're going to solve this problem purely from a developer point of view, one of the things that you can do is you can start to partition your keys. Right? So if you had, so if if we say we're, we're dealing with customers and we've got Adam, right, and there's far, and and the occurrence of Adam in our database is far too skewed to deal with, all right. What we can actually do then is, is to just to create a partition. So if we've got a string key Adam, right, we can then we can then do string key Adam, then a hyphen, and then we can start to add a binary chop, and we, and we can say, well, all Adams which are in you know the northeast sales section will get Adam hyphen any. And all the rest of them in the southeast will get Adam hyphen se. Okay, so you can start to partition up that key, and as you change that string, that means that key is then different, and they'll get sent to different um, different um, reducers. Obviously, you then might have to have another MapReduce job at the end to aggregate that data. But then, of course, you're dealing with aggregated data that you then want to further aggregate. So you're not dealing with the volumes that you first started off with. So you're kind of chunking it down. Right? And every time that gets too big, every time Adam Northeast, for example, gets too big again on overwhelmed server, you just add another binary chop. You say, well, this is how big that is. How can I, how can I deal with half of it? You know? And then you just keep doing that binary chop every time. And that's how you can, how you can improve that from a, from a developer standpoint. Although there are obviously tweaks that you can be made on the administration side of things that I want to stay away from. Okay? All right, let's crack on. So the question there is, what happens when the when the um, when the node that's running the reduce process um, goes down? And the answer to that is, um, it's same as back here. It's it's the, the work is shared, because remember I said the um, everything is stored once and replicated twice. Um, so what happens is, it's basically first finish wins, right? So the job tracker keeps it keeps a track of all the jobs, and if you two are doing the same um, reduce function. Okay, you might win, and I'll say that's fine, thank you very much. And then when you, I, I don't really care what happens to you now. But if you're doing the work and you and you crash, it falls over, the hard drive fails, you know, you basically you lose the cabinet, you know, somebody decides now's a good idea to reboot the VMs or whatever. It doesn't really matter because you'll then at some point finish, and I'll still get, I'll still get the result. Okay. So, so that, again, that's all handled in the Hadoop for you. So is there any resilience on the main node with job track? So the question there, there's a great question. There's a question there um, as to, is there any resilience here on the actual name node, or does that represent a single point of failure? And the answer to that question is um, yes and no. So yes, it does. Um, yes, it does represent a single point of failure. However, to get that, when you're, when you're creating a Hadoop cluster, you get a name node and you get a secondary name node. Now, the secondary name node is not hot swappable, right? It's not, it's not good to go. But in here, there's all kind of log files which represent the jobs which are happening. So actually, to get up and running again, what happens is all you have to do is to copy the log files from this server storage um, onto the secondary name node, then start up the secondary name node. All of the it will then read the job files and everything like that. It'll catch up to where it'll go and it'll restart jobs where required. And so the amount of time you are down for is basically the amount of time it takes you to do that work. Okay, which is not particularly long which is why it was never addressed um, initially. Now, it is being addressed now. So the, the second, um, second iterations of, of Hadoop that's coming out, um, and, which is out, 
Um, and, and basically, so hot swappability is something that I'm not 100% sure how far along the road we are. If it's not available right now, it's going to be available really soon. So you can either still stick with, with that, with the, with the left. Yeah. Where you where you've got resilience, you gotta stick with this. Where you just you know you're just down for the amount of time it takes you to bring the next one up, or you can go with this um, hot swappable resilience. So what happens is the name nodes will just switch when one goes down. Okay, any more for any more? No. Okay, so let's crack on. So we did that. All right. So how do we install it? What I'm going to talk about now is I'm going to we're talking about specifically in the Microsoft um, stack now. So in the Microsoft stack, the story for Hadoop is um, there is what is called the Hortonworks data platform for Windows. All right, and you can install that on your own servers in your own data centers or, or whatever. Okay, you can go to Azure and you can you can um, fire up um, an, an instance of Windows Server and you can you can install the Hortonworks data platform onto that if you want. But further on top of that. Within Azure, there's another flavor of Hadoop called HD Insight, which is particularly um, Hortonworks data platform for Windows in the Azure environment. Okay, so actually, if anybody here runs Azure, if you go into the Azure, um, if you go into the Azure portal, you'll be able to see an HD Insight instance that you can fire up, and that's basically Hadoop. Okay, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Everybody has, has anybody seen that in the Azure portal? Yep. Anybody here run that? Anybody running an HD Insight? No. All right, so it's the HD Insight that we're going to talk about. Now, specifically for, for devs where you just want to get into it and you want to mess around with it, there is an HD Insight emulator that you can install on your laptop. It's what I'm running here, okay? Now, to install that, the easiest way to do it is to go to the web platform installer here and look for um, HD Insight, and you'll find this HD Insight emulator for Windows Azure. Now, it's for 64 megabit, 64 megabit, uh, sorry, 64 bit, um, versions of the operating system only. All right. Now, if you've got a 32-bit version of the operating system installed, when you search for this, you just won't find it. All right. It took me ages to work out what happened there the first time I did this. All right. When you search for HD Insight, so this is a top tip. When you search for HD Insight inside the web platform installer, and you're on a 32-bit machine, it won't tell you that you're on a 32-bit machine, so you can't have it. It just says zero results, and you go. I don't understand why, because I've installed this a number of times. I just go on here, I search for it, I click and install. All right? So if you see that kind of behavior, it's because you're on a 32-bit version of the operating system. All right? So you just install it in exactly the same way. You select it, you hit, um, you hit install, you accept the um, license agreement, which probably says you have to give a kidney on your firstborn. Um, I'm not sure anybody ever reads these things, because at the end of the day, you want the software. So um, click I accept. Um, it installs just the same as any other um, in any other piece of software out of the web platform installer. Tells you everything was successful, and you can see it's installed these two things. You can see, as I said before, HD Insight is based on the Hortonworks data platform for Windows here. Okay, so that gets installed as well. You need to know that because if you want to uninstall it, okay, to uninstall it properly, you have to uninstall both of these things. Right? If you want to go to the, you know, if you want to go to the service and actually get it uninstalled, you have to uninstall both of those things. All right? Once it's done that, you'll find these um, three icons on your desktop. There's the Hadoop command line, um, a web interface into the Hadoop name node, and um, a web interface into the Hadoop um, MapReduce job um, tracker. Okay, so those three things will be installed um, on your on your desktop. Also, if you pop open your services. Okay, you'll see a shared load of services that um, HD Insight has actually installed and will have automatically started in your, um, in your services for you. It's worth having a look at that, okay, because, and here's another top tip, right, you'll see this, you see this, when this gets installed, it gets installed under, as you can see, the .hadoop user, okay, that user has a password policy set to expire, right? <laughs> that caught me out the first time. And the only way you'll know that is when you go here one day and you pop this open and you go Hadoop-FS, so you do Hadoop-FS-LS to show you the, the HDFS um, hard drive. I say hard drive, obviously it's an abstracted, it's a dis di distributed file system, but you can look at it as if it's a file system. And you say, please show me everything in the file system, and it says, no, there is no file system I've been running. 
right? And you go, well, that's ridiculous. And you pop, you pop the um, name node open, and it goes, nope, there's nothing on the end of this port. And you go, why is there nothing on the end of this port? All right. So you pop open the services to see which one is not running, to see that they're all not running. And you go, well, they're all on an automatic start. You know. So you start the first one, and it goes, no, I can't start. And then, of course, it doesn't tell you why. It just goes, no, I'm not starting. So you have to go look in the event log to find out. It says, oh, because it's a user ID and password failure. right? So you have to go and pop this user open and uh, set the password to not expire. So I suggest right, that you do that right after you've installed it. All right? Pop open this user here and set the password not to, not to expire. Because that will catch you out. Because it, it's, it's, I have no idea what it's set for by default. But it was ages after, you know, the British standard ages after I installed it that I had that issue. And of course, it can, you completely forget about it. And you will too. Right? Until that happens, and then you go, oh, yeah, I remember. All right? So once you've installed it, pop this open and set that password not to expire. So how do I get my C-sharp code running? Now that I've installed this thing, how do I get my C-sharp code running on that? All right? Now, I don't know about you, but I am fed up of word count examples. Right? I've seen enough of word count examples. As I said before, I do not believe that there is a great necessity in the world for words to be counted. Okay, so we're going to do something a little bit different. What we're going to do is a bit of um, racehorse prediction, right? This is a kind of um, workshop that I ran yesterday. We're not going to get into all that kind of, we're not, going to, we're not going to get into how that's done, right? But we're just going to use that as an example, basically just to get away from word count, because I'm fed up with word count, right? So we're going to have a prediction engine to tell us who's going to win this horse race based on number of horses at number of um, courses throughout the UK, right? So that's the, that's the example we're going to run with, just because. Okay, so the first thing we can do is um, natively Hadoop jobs and therefore HD Insight jobs, natively they're written in Java, okay? But because there was an outcry at some point, because everybody said, quite frankly, I don't want to write Java uh, anymore when I'm doing my jobs. I mean, it was, Hadoop was actually um, written by Java programmers, so obviously everything natively is Java and there's nothing wrong with that, okay? But once it took off and everybody said, this is a really cool idea, we want to use it, but really, I don't want to have to learn another programming language just to use this framework, right? I mean, it must be the only framework in the world that says, hey, you can use my framework, but you must write in the native language, right? You don't have to do that anymore. So what happened was, after a bit of an outcry, the developers of um, Hadoop came up with this idea of a streaming API. And what that really means is, if, if your programming language of choice can write to and read from the standard in and out, so, I, so in, a, in the Microsoft Word, the console. So you can read from the console and write to the console in your programming language, then you can write jobs for um, Hadoop in general and for HD Insight in particular. So C Sharp is one such job, sorry, C Sharp is one such language, so we can write our jobs in the language. And the advantage, streaming has some advantages and has some disadvantages, but one of the advantages is it's the closest thing to the actual language that you can write to get jobs working on Hadoop, okay? In fact, you don't have to, when you look at the code for a streaming job in C Sharp, you don't have to write any Hadoop specific code whatsoever. You're just writing plain vanilla C Sharp. You have to do certain things with the code afterwards and we'll get into that, right? But the actual code you write, it's just the standard C Sharp code that you would write any day of the week, okay? So let's have a look at getting that going. Let's pop, um, let's pop this open. This is our streaming. What we've got here is we just create um, an ordinary um, an ordinary solution, and inside the solution we have two um, console application, one called reducer um, and one called mapper. You can actually call them anything you want, it doesn't really matter, okay? It's just easier for instructional demonstration purposes for me to call the the executable that does the mapping mapper and to call the executable that does the reducing reducer. But it, that's just a naming convention. You can you can call it what, whatever you want to do. All right. So here we'll have a quick look at this. All right. This is going to look very familiar to you. Okay. It's just um, a main function here, and then what we do is this main function is going to read from the command. It's going to read from the console until there is no more input. All right. So the Hadoop framework itself will feed your executable, basically. Um, the Hadoop is going to have that 64 megabyte chunk, okay? And what's going to happen is the Hadoop framework will take your code, your executable, and it will feed it as an input. One, basically, it'll, it'll call it 
with one line of the imp or that 64 megabyte file at a time. Okay, so you want to read the console, you want to read a line until there are no more lines to read, right? And that's what that line does. And then what we're going to do is we've basically got a CSV file which has a horse, a jockey, and a course in it. So we're going to split these up. Of course, it's a CSV file, so there we're going to split on comma and, and to give us a string array of fields. And then we're going to split those out into horse, jockey, and course just by saying, well, that's the first one, that's the second one, and that's the third one. Nothing complicated there. And then what we're going to do is our stats, then we're going to get these stats. This is the this is the call for making the prediction. Okay. And we're going to have, we're going to feed it in the horse, the course, and the jockey. And down here, and this is just this. Um, function does nothing, all right? But this is the function in which you would calculate all the probabilities if you were actually doing this properly. Here, of course, we're just doing it by random numbers, okay? Because this is just instructional and demonstrational, because I don't want to disappear down a rabbit hole of doing predictive analytics, okay? But if you were going to do it properly, this is the function in which you would do the actual probability calculation, all right? But what we're going to, what we're going to return there is the, the, the stats for that horse being ridden by that jockey at that course, okay? And we're gonna store that in stats, and then we're just gonna write out tab delimited this time. We're gonna write out the horse and its stats, all right? So that's what, the, that's what the mapper is going to do. And then the reducer is going to take each of these, and it's gonna get one of the, those lines for the mapper, all right? And now it's going to have, again, it's gonna split on tab, we're going to have a key and we're going to have a value. Um, our stats obviously needs to be split up because they're all that was all combined together. We're going to split that up. We're going to sum those together, right, to get a sum of the actual um, probabilities. So basically, what we what that was doing was it was looking at one piece of evidence. And now what we're going to do is we're going to create all the we're going to create a, an aggregation of the bits of evidence for that um, horse winning, and then we're going to push out a key value pair. Um, and that index is going to be the actual index, actual probability of that horse winning. Okay, so what's going to come, what's going to be the output of the reducer is horse name and its probability. Okay, and there isn't any Hadoop specific code in there, right? That's all C sharp code. If you're a C sharp programmer, you recognize it all. There's nothing out of the ordinary in there. It's all fairly straightforward, fairly basic C sharp code. All right. So now what we have to do is we have to get that running on our um, Hadoop cluster. So what we want to do is we want to drop down here to the <coughs> to the desktop and open up our um, our Hadoop name node. So what we what we have to do is to get things running, we have to do a number of things. So first of all, what we have to do is we have to get the input file up into Hadoop. Okay, the, the file that we want to do. So what we're going to do now is we're going to say to Hadoop, um, Hadoop, I want to use your file system and I want to make a directory and we'll call that demo in. And Hadoop goes away and Hadoop does that. And the next thing we want to do is we want to put the file that we want um, to the the input file that we want Hadoop to work on um, up there. So if we grab this like so and we say where is it? It's that file in there. So now we can grab this, uh, I'm running out of real estate of course because I'm working on a reduced um, space. So what we can do here is we say, hey Hadoop, um, what I want to do is I want to use your file system and I want to put a file from my local machine, which is here, it's this one here, so I'm going to drop that down there. It's that file there and I want to put that in demo in, thanks very much. And Hadoop will go away and do that, thank you very much. The next thing we have to do is we have to tell the name node which we have to tell the name node um, which executables are going to be our mapper and our reducer. So we have to actually get our executables, which are living on, at the minute on our dev machine, up and up to our uh, Hadoop cluster. So the next thing we're going to do here is let's make another um, another directory, and we'll call that demo apps. So, and what we want to do again is we want to um, put, this time we're going to take the mapper and the executable um, code here. So we grab the mapper first, stick that up there into demo apps. 
and then we'll do the same thing. Put dpfs minus put, and we'll take the reducer, and we'll push that up into demo um, apps as well. So now we've got everything that we actually want into HDFS, right? So we've we've pushed up our um, document that we want to work on, our date that we want to work on, and our mapper, and our reducer. So now what we actually have to do now is we just have to start a job, okay? And to do that, I am going to um, use this command here um, for two reasons. I've got this uh, written down here. One, if I type, I find in, um, in sessions, if I type this in, right, from memory, I get it right about three times out of five, okay? Which means two times out of five, I make a complete peg zero of it, and the job doesn't work. Right? And secondly, it's easier to have it written out like this in a single line on this file so I can explain it to you than it is trying to explain it to you when it's typed out in the command line. What we do here is the, um, the streaming API is contained within a jar file. So the first thing we have to do is we have to tell Hadoop here that we want to call a jar file. And then we have to say, by the way, it's the streaming jar that I want to use, right? Because I want to use the streaming API. And then you say, right, I want you to push out these files onto the cluster, because at the moment the, the name node knows about it, so when you start off the job, you have to tell it which files um, you want it to use. So here, we've got an FDF, an, an HDFS um, URL to where we've put the mapper and the reducer, remember we put them in demo apps, okay? So we've told, we've told um, Hadoop which files we want to use. And then we're gonna say, the function, the executable code that I want you to call for the mapper is called this. And this is why it doesn't really matter what it is. Remember when I said, when I showed you the code, I said it doesn't matter what you call it. Well, this is why, because you actually define to Hadoop what the mapper is. So actually this name here doesn't really mean anything. And then you say, I want, and the reducer is going to be this executable here. And then you say the input, the directory in which you will find the data I want you to use is in this directory. Notice here I can use the whole directory but I don't have to specify a file name. So what that means is if my data is contained within one file, I can just say, hey, use this file. But if, it, if it's maybe 20,000 little log files, right, and they're all, they're all um, formatted the same way, they all have the same structure, I can just drop 20,000 files in there and say, hey, it's that data. Just use the, the data in that entire directory. And Hadoop will quite happily sort that out for you. And the last thing we have to tell it is where we actually want the output file to go. Right? We want the output file to go to demo out. And when we're calling the streaming API, one thing to remember here, because be, it'll be different from, I'll show you something later on. One thing you have to remember here is this directory cannot exist already. Okay, the reason that it can't exist already is because Hadoop will think to itself, hang on a second, I might already, if this, if this directory exists, right, I'm a distributed file system. Okay, just because this person is calling a job and wants the output there, doesn't mean to say that this is the same person who called the job that created this um, directory in the first place, so I don't want to overwrite that guy's work because it's in a Hadoop cluster. It might have taken hours of work, and so it'll specify. No, you must you must specify your own directory for this job, and right? it mustn't already exist until I create it for this job. All right, and you'll actually get an error if this ex if this um, exists already, which is quite interesting because I'm going to wait, cut paste this code straight in here and run it, and I can't remember actually if I deleted this directory or not from the last time I did this um, demo. So we might actually see this error <laughs> happening. Okay, so if I grab all of this just now and copy that, and then if I paste that down into here, we can actually run that demo now. So what you see here is um, basically the, the um, job tracker starting. We see some information getting put out to the screen here. We can see it's got a job ID number. Um, we can see that the mapper is already finished. It's 100% complete. And then we'll see the reducer is doing its work. Um, chugging away and at some point it will become 100% complete. There is um, a mechanism, an API mechanism, whereby you can actually get feedback as to how far that job is along the line. I haven't hooked that up yet, so so basically it's um, it's all or nothing. Hadoop will say, none of it is done, and all of a sudden I'll say, all of it is done. Okay, If you need some feedback um, throughout the process, there are there's a mechanism for that as well. Okay, it says it's completed now, and right enough, it's put that in demo out, and I obviously did tidy up after the last time I ran this demo because I didn't get an error. So just to see what it's done there, if we go into um, Hadoop, and we say um, fsls demo out, 
we can see there's a bunch of stuff. There's a it's put in any log files that we want in here. It's put success and um, marker inside this directory here. But this part dash and then followed by an index number is our output. Now because I'm running the HD emulator on my machine, I don't have a cluster obviously. Okay, so there's one mapper, one reducer, and it's my machine. So the output from this reducer is going to say part dash zero, and it's going to be everything in there. You will get a one a, a part dash x output for each of your reducers, okay? And then it'll be up to you to come in here and then cut them together to be one output, if you want it as one output, obviously. Okay, we'll just have a quick um, look at this just now, just to, just to make sure there's no smoke and mirrors and I wasn't lying to you. This does actually contain stuff. We can have a demo um, out part star, and it should show us that on the screen. And there we go. So there's our horses. You can see I've got no um, imagination whatsoever. I've called them horses um, 1 through, I can't remember, 20, I think. And there's the probabilities of the, um, no, it's not. It's the index of that horse actually working. But there's obviously not a, a probability because we're over one. It's the index of the, that likelihood of the, of the horse um, winning. Okay. So that's there on Hadoop at the minute. And that is how you get stuff running um, using the streaming API. Okay. The benefit of the streaming API is that you don't have to write any Hadoop specific code there whatsoever. Okay. How goes the enemy? Five to three. Excellent. And just checking. Half past three the session finishes. Good. So we're making good time. Let's get back to our slides. So that was streaming. Okay. I'm not going to lie to you. That's a ball ache. Right, that is, it's a faff having to do that the whole time because you write the code and then you have to go on the Hadoop and you have to specify all these things and you have to put them up there and you have to get those little commands right and Hadoop is a real bitch for that. You put a comma in the wrong place or a space in the wrong place and I'll just go, nope, I don't understand a word you're saying, right? And that's, you know, when I said I can get that, I can write that line of code, that, that command from memory and I get it right about three times in five, right? Because if you put the space in the wrong place, it's just a pain in the neck, right? There is an easier way to do it. It means that you have to start conforming to the SDK and the, the framework a little bit. The benefit of that is that it's not such a ball ache and you don't have to do all these horrible things because the framework will do it for you. The downside is, you know, you have to learn to do, you have to learn to, to use the framework a little bit, but actually it's not, it's not a huge amount of work that you have to do. Okay, so we'll take a look at that now. And we'll see, um, we'll see what kind of work had to be done um, to get that done. So now if we go across here and we grab the, where did it go? There we go, the map reduce. This is um, using a framework now. So to use the framework, what we do is we just, we have to, just have to new get in the, we have to new get in the Hadoop, uh, Microsoft Hadoop um, framework and um, get that from new get. If you new get that in, it'll bring in all the dependencies, one of which is the, is the JSON dependency, okay? <clears throat> Once we do that, what we have to do is we have to, we have to create two um, classes, right? First, unsurprisingly, is the mapper. So we've got a mapper class which extends mapper base, okay? And what's going to happen here is we're going to get, much the same way as our streaming API code did, we're going to get a line of input, all right? Much, much the same way. We'll get that fed into this um, function, but we'll also get this thing called context where in the streaming API we were just writing out to the console, we're just doing console.write, here what we're going to do is we're going to emit onto a context. And the framework is going to handle what it does with that. Okay, And that's the only real difference is now instead of writing to an output, we're going to be writing to um, a context. But you can see the algorithm is exactly the same. We're going to do exactly the same thing. Split up the fields of that input, get the stats. Okay, And the only thing that changes is this bit down here Okay, where we say emit a key value and pass a key value instead of actually writing out onto the console with our tab delimiter or our, or our comma delimiter or however we want to do it. Okay, that is the only difference. Here this is just exactly the same, that is exactly the same um, function, okay, because I just cut and pasted it. Right? So there's very little change. The second thing we have to do is to write out our, our we have to create a reducer, okay? And our reducer is um, inherits from reducer combiner base. Now a combiner is a thing, remember I showed you the diagram where I said, and here it does the Hadoop shuffle. Okay. By default, it'll do the Hadoop shuffle in a specific way. Okay. If you want different behavior, you can actually define a combiner, right, which will do that work in the way that you want it done. Because right? you've got a specific combination job that you want done. It isn't just you know, 
It isn't just alphabetical or numerical, or whatever. You want something specific. We haven't gone into that. We, do, we don't want to do anything specific here. So we're, we haven't created a combiner, but we can if we want. And we just um, we have our reducer here. And then what this reducer is going to get is reducer is going to get a key, and it's going to get an i enumerable of values. Okay, not, not too surprisingly. And again, we're going to have this context that we're going to write out on. And again, here you can see that this algorithm hasn't really changed since I showed you the, the very first one where we had this problem. Again, we're just going to take it, we're going to split it up, we're going to sum what um, comes in in the actual i enumerable, and then we're going to take it as a string, and then we're going to push it out onto the, onto the context. Okay? <coughs> that isn't hugely... You have had to do some specific work in the dupe, but it's, it's, not, it's not outrageous amount of work that you had to do there to get it working. And the third thing that we have to do is in the main program itself, we have to um, create this Hadoop configuration file. And the Hadoop configuration file was just the things that I had um, in the command line on that command, okay? Although I've not had to do so much work here because I don't have to specify everything. All I actually have to specify here is the input path and the output path. And you notice this time it doesn't matter that the output path already exists, okay? Um, it says, um, the SDK here says, ah, I don't really care. If you want to overwrite someone else's work, I'm quite happy to help you do that. All right? So you might think to yourself, well, that's cool. What happens to the other stuff that you have to specify? Because you had to specify a whole bunch of files and stuff like that before. All right? We'll come to that in a second. Then once I've created this um, configuration, I then have to connect to my Hadoop cluster. Right? Now, here I'm using the connect um, function, but I'm not passing any parameters because I'm using the local one here. So if I pass an empty constructor, then the SDK will look for the, um, the HD Insight emulator on your machine, on localhost, or it'll look for something on localhost. Okay? If you actually want to use a cluster in the cloud or someplace else, you then have to pass you know, the IP address, user ID and password and all the rest of it, the credentials to, to get on that. I don't, want to, I don't have to do that because I'm using the local machine here. Once you've gotten a hold of Hadoop, you say, I want to run a map reduce job, and I want to run this mapper and this reducer using this configuration, please. Okay. You don't always have to have a reducer. A good way of thinking about map and reduce, right? It's not exactly correct, but it maps quite well. Is to think of a SQL statement, okay, where the mapper is the select statement and the reducer is the grouping statement. Not every select, not every um, SQL um, job that you have, every SQL select statement requires a grouping. Okay? In much the same way, not every Hadoop job requires a reducer. Right? Sometimes after the mapper, you're done. In the same way as sometimes on a, in um, SQL, when you've done the select, you're done. Right? If that's the case, you just miss that out. Miss the reducer out. And that's basically the same way as telling, um, is, is setting the Hadoop configuration to say reducers equals zero. There's no reducing stage. I'm done when I'm, when I'm done the mapping. And that's all you have to do. All right? So now we can set this off, like so. And then we'll be able to answer. And now we can answer. So we get, a, we get a warning that says, hey, by the way, I've just deleted that file. So if you needed it, tough to do. Um, there's nothing you do about that. But this answers the question about what happens about that other stuff that I specified in the streaming command line that I, don't have to, that I didn't in the configuration for Hadoop. All right? Actually, the SDK knows because you've said, I want to run a job with a reducer and a mapper, right? So it says, well, okay, I've auto-detected those dependencies because if you say you want that job and you've specified it within this, within the um, solution, I'm just going to use those, right? And so it actually sends those files for you. So we, we actually had to type in that line, dash files, do this one, do this one, do this one. It knows that, okay? And it sends it anyway. Okay, so it's done that work, and again, it's put the output in now in demo out. Okay, here. Here you can see the command. It shows you the command that it actually ran. And this is what you would have to type in, right, if you were using. But you can see under the hood, the SDK is just using that same streaming API as we did, right? So you can see here, right, here's the snapshot. There's the Hadoop command. There's the jar. Okay, there's the streaming.jar file. Okay, here it's sending out a whole load of other dependencies. But here you can see the dot files, and here's the stuff that that it has to send as well, okay? But you can see it's absolutely the same streaming um, API that we used earlier, right? So there's no smoke and mirrors, really. You can see that it's using that. Okay. Can you um, 
So that assumes that you've got the input file already there. Yes, you because I did. Push the yes, absolutely. So <coughs> the, the, the question the gentleman asked there was, that assumes that the file's already there. It, it absolutely does. And I knew the file was already there because it was there from the streaming API. But you're absolutely right. If this was a one-off and if you were doing this the first time, you still have to put your data onto Hadoop. I mean, the, um, HD, the SDK isn't going to know what data you want to run. Okay? You tell it which directory it's in, but it's going to assume that you've already put the data there. So you have to do that put step. Um, separately. Are we constrained to files only? Are you can so the question there is you constrained to files only? I'm not entirely sure what you what we you have mean. Other data sources. Um, so the question there is can you have other data sources? And the answer to that question is is no. Um, and yes. So it's no because at the at the point where you have to run the job, okay, that must exist as some kind of file on HDFS. So it's a no from that point of view. But it's a yes from the point of view as there are all kinds of other um, Apache Foundation and projects like Scoop and um, Flume and all of these kind of things which will help you extract um, data from databases and from streams like Twitter. You can just listen to a Twitter stream or whatever and get it into HDFS. Okay. So from that point of view, it's a yes. You can use other data. You can use other data structures, but not just with the technology that I'm showing you in this session. But there are other technologies available that that you can use in conjunction with what I'm doing here in order for you to use data from other data sources. Okay. But at the point of the point of sale, as it was at the point of actual execution, then that data must exist on e in HDFS and Hadoop. Yes, sir. Uh, just a quick one. So this was this was run on a simple farm of one mapper and one reduce. Yes. If on the had, emulator here. Yeah, if they had like a couple of members and a couple yep. of producers, what would be the rule that Hadoop would follow to distribute tasks across? Would it be based on key definition or would it be based on something else? Or No, so the question there is how does... Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, so, the, so the question there is basically when I, when I give, when I define a job like this and I say here's the data, here's the mapper, here's the reducer, how does Hadoop decide? Yeah. Um, so there is a server, which can be running on the same server as your name, or it could be a, a separate server called the job tracker. And it's up to the job tracker to decide um, which of the nodes in the cluster are, are um, I can't think of what the word opposite of busy is, quiet, not busy, not doing anything, right? And so basically it just looks around for, it, it looks around for, for quiet nodes and says, right, you know, get to work node. It's like a load balancer. Right? It's exactly, yes. It's, 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 it's like a very sophisticated load balancer. Yeah, exactly. It tries to make sure that there's an even amount of work spread across um, the cluster. You can tweak that. There are configuration files that you can say, you know, this is how I want it done. But if you just let it go, um, that's how it's going to do it in a default way. And I would suggest, unless you're a really experienced Hadoop admin, you just let it do the default thing. Okay? Because it's a bit like a compiler. You know, the compiler's going to know how to write, you know, optimize code better than, than you do. So just let it do its job. Okay. Yes, sir. So with the example you've shown us now, we've installed Hadoop on a single cluster. So let's say you're in your data center and you want to have multiple clusters. How do you tell Hadoop that there are more commodity servers I can use rather than just that single instance? Do you have to install Hadoop on each one of them? Or where do you specify that? I'm not entirely sure what the, the question was there. Um, you kind of confused me in the middle. Right, so because now you've, we're just using the one node, your local server. Yes. <coughs> so what if you want to have multiple, um, multiple nodes to sort of split the job? How do you right. specify that? So is, the, is, is what you're asking there, how do I tell the name node that I've added new servers yeah. to the cluster? Yeah. Right, excellent. So the answer to that question is there are, there are two ways to do it. You can do it manually by installing a new server and installing Hadoop on that server and then getting the IP address on that server and then going to the name node and telling the name node that the server is now part of the cluster. But there's also, uh, there's also a piece of software called Ambari um, which will help you do all that kind of stuff. So it helps you with the provisioning of new servers and things like that. And, that we've, and Ambari is basically a server where you, it's basically a system where you, you basically point at IP addresses and say make this part of this cluster and it will it will look and see what software has to be loaded on that server and it will load all that all that um, um, 
load all the um, required software onto the new server, and that will go to the name node, and it will say this is all part of the cluster, it will make it part of that cluster. Um, and so it very much depends on how you want to do it. You know, if you're very experienced to do admin and you maybe only have one machine to do, it's maybe faster just to spin up that machine and, and, and change the configurations file manually, you know, load all the software, change it manually. If you're, maybe, if you're maybe configuring three or four servers, okay, then you want to be using Ambari. Bearing in mind that you'll probably be using Ambari anyway because that gives you cluster monitoring and tells you about the health of your cluster, which ones are working hard and all that kind of things. Right? So you'll probably have Ambari or something like that in the background there anyway. You may as well use that to provision your extra servers when, when you require them to come online. Yes? Just on the infrastructure issue again, in your environment you have moat. Do you have uh, the name node and the job node and the actual node running the job all running on one machine? In this particular this example, particular sense, yeah. in this particular example, yes. For the Digital. HD Inside emulator, everything is just one, one machine. It's this laptop here. But logically, you've got, you still have the name. Logically, you still have, yes, absolutely. Yep. And actually, if, if you take, if you if you have just vanilla Hadoop, if you go to the Apache website and download Hadoop, you can install Hadoop in th in three ways. Okay, you install it as one single node only, right? In which case, one node does everything. You can install it in what's called a pseudo cluster mode where you get to specify you've got a different name node and a different job tracker and all these different things, but actually it fakes those through ports. It's still running on the one machine because it's still here on your laptop, but it fakes it as being a different machine through putting it on a different port number. Okay? And then you can install it as a cluster, say it's a genuine cluster and here is the name node, here is the job tracker, and here is the other, here is the, the nodes. Okay? So you can do that with vanilla um, Hadoop, but here, for the HD Insight emulator, everything is just on the one machine. It is really, it is just, you know, for, for dev purposes only, you know, for you guys to, to get your heads around it. You know, you wouldn't actually use it for any real work because at the end of the day, it's there, the whole Hadoop infrastructure for my producing everything is there to help us with the scalability issues. And if you've got everything on one laptop, then you're back down to having the scalability issue that you can only work with the memory and the CPU within your laptop or your dev machine. So if I want to create the cluster in Azure, could I use the HD Insights instance? That yes, you can. I'd create yep. multiple instances of those, one each one reaching into a node? Absolutely, yep. So, sorry, the, the question there was, you know, if I'm using it in Azure and I'm using the portal, when I do that, can I actually specify, can I actually create a real cluster when I'm using HD Insight properly inside the node? inside Azure, and the answer to that question is yes. You actually, inside of Azure, using HD Insight, you are actually creating a proper cluster. Um, did, did you have a question? I think you were there. I did. I did another one, yeah. So just to pick up on, on the point the gentleman made earlier on about the data, data where the data can come from and yes. where it can hold it. Mm -hmm. So in your example, you used the storage that's provisioned from one machine. So HDFS mm -hmm. runs from one, one storage. So in a larger cluster, this distributed file system will have to be provisioned from some, I assume, central storage location and shared through the distributed file system to all the nodes? Is that how it works? Or would it be kind of like a story the symbol of all the individual storages from, from each of the individual um, processing machines? Or OK, so the because question. The data, <laughs> the data, the data so basically, the question is, I, I, think we can, I think I can just summarize that for you. I think your question is, how does HDFS work? You know, how does that distributed file storage work? Is it actually on one machine or is it genuinely distributed? And the answer to your question is it's genuinely distributed. When I, go, when I showed you there and I did, um, I did Hadoop FS-LS and I got a directory structure, okay, that is completely abstracted. That's just to make me feel happy, okay, that I see one file there and I see a directory structure. Right? That directory structure exists nowhere in reality. Okay? What happens there is there's at least one file there is at least broken down into 64 megabyte chunks and it's spread out across the nodes, okay? And the name node knows where, knows where all the parts are and it also knows where all the parts are replicated to, okay? And when you ask for, um, when you ask for the listing of a particular, particular directory, the name node then decodes that into what it actually means and it says, yes, okay, this is, this is what I have actually assigned to, to that directory structure. But that directory structure that you see is an abstraction and it exists nowhere in that form. Okay, I think you had a question and then we'll need to get back on yeah, it or we'll uh, overrun. On the HD Insights, is that only available in production in Azure or can you have that on your own data center? 
So the question there is, is HD Insight only available under Azure? And the answer to that question is, is, is yes, because HD Insight is the flavor of the Hadoop data platform for Windows, especially for Azure. So if you wanted your own data center with your own servers, what you would install is the is HDP, is the, yeah. the Hortonworks data platform for Windows, okay, so which is available is over the SDK yeah. is still stored directly. Absolutely, because if you remember when I installed it, right, it is the HD, it is the HDP, right? HD Insight is the HDP in Azure, okay? So when I when I installed um, HD Insight Emulator on my machine, I actually showed you that slide and I actually highlighted the HDP is installed as well. So it's exactly the same. So, the, so it's not a case of will the SDK work there as well. It's the same thing. The SDK works here. It is using HDP under the hood. And so if you had your own data center, you would install HDP straight from the Hortonworks website and it would just work exactly the same. Okay, we'll crack on just now and we'll do the last bit um, and then I'll take any other questions at the end. So let's get back to these slides. So that was the SDK, right? The issue now is how do I how do I visualize my results? Because I showed you I did that cat command, right? And I basically got you know a CSV file. That isn't any use to me, right? Um, as an end result. It's fine when I'm doing dev work and it's fine until I get results, but once I've verified that that's right. I can't show that to my manager. I can't take that to the business and go, oh, well, if you want to see that, all you need to do is to log on to this job tracker here and go to this and you can see the CSV file all for yourself, right? What is it that, that we can do to help visualize that, okay? And actually, the good news is we can actually just use um, good old Excel, believe it or not. Um, and so I'm gonna demonstrate that now. <clears throat> the first thing I wanna do is go across here to um, a command line. I want to tidy up here a little bit uh, and um, fake some data. Um, so we do FS and we do RMR and we get rid of um, demo out just to tidy it up. And then um, if I recreate that directory, uh, demo out like so. <coughs> and now I've got a file. Um, he said, where did I put it? Is it in data? Yes, right down there, racing predictions. Right, so if I grab this now and I say, I do FS, uh, put, and I grab this file, I drop it into the output directory, then that's kind of like, that's kind of like just, um, what I'm demonstrating there is I, I've run some kind of Hadoop job and this is the output and it is in demo out the same as, as, as anything else. So what I want to do now is I want to fire up Excel. Apparently you have to spell it right. If I fire up Excel now, yes, it's fine, go away. And I open this up. <coughs> We're going to use a set of tools called Power BI, right? Have anybody here heard of that before? Yeah. Not louder. Yes, some of you have, some of you haven't. Okay, so it's um, it's kind of an add-in for Excel. You can go to the Power BI site, read all about it. I um, I suggest you install it because it's got some really cool tools. Even if you're not using big data stuff, it's got some really cool tools. But some of the cool tools allow us to work in in the big data environment as well. <coughs> and one of them is called Power Query, and we're going to use Power Query now. Um, to actually get a hold of that data that we created in HDFS. So if we go over here and we look in data, we get this, um, we get the um, ability to get external data and you can get external data from lots of different places, okay? So what happens is our power query kind of extends that a little bit and we can get data from other sources. And one of the other sources just happens to be an HDF file system, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna select the HDFS file system there and this pop-up is gonna arrive and it's gonna say, well, where's your server? Okay, and in this particular case, our server is on localhost, but of course, it could be anywhere in the cloud. Just put in the IP address of where your server lives. <coughs> it says, thank you very much. I shall just trot off there. And it says, this is what I know about your HDFS server. Um, and what I'm gonna do here is if I just change that by, um, move that across. Da, 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 da. Let's do date modified, um, put them into descending order. Okay, if we go up here, we can see there's horse racing predictions. This is where I um, actually I was um, rehearsing earlier on. Sometimes what happens is when you connect to the server, you don't get the most up-to-date version for some reason. Right? I see that a lot. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. 
that risk in prediction, as well as the file I want, I can see by the date modified that that was when I was running through this morning. So if you see that, if, if you see that you're not seeing the files that you expect to see because it's not there, if you just hit the um, refresh tab here, it'll go off and apparently redo what it already just did, right? And, and read it back again. Um, and now when we're looking at it, we get, we get this um, date modified here, which is wrong, so the time on my, my, um, my machine must be out. But once we see the file we want, we can just click on this binary um, tab here, and it says, and it's brought back that file. Okay, so this is the file that was on HDFS. Right? Now one thing to remember about HDFS is you're not gonna get column headers, okay, because that file is written, you, you couldn't guarantee which of the reducers would finish first to put a header in, right? So there's no way to put headers in. So when you pull back a, a CSV file or something like that from HDFS, it's not gonna have headers. But you want to use headers in Excel, obviously. So this is the point where you can actually um, write that. And this, you can put the headers in now. So that column is going to be the race course. If we go across here, this column is going to be the horse itself. And this column here is going to be our prediction of prediction of um, it winning or not. Okay, that looks good to me. We put in the um, put in the headers and everything like that. Is here is where you would clean up anything you want. If you didn't want all of the all of the columns, you could chop out the columns. I'm not going to. I don't intend to give you you know a, a session on Power Query. I'm just telling you here is where you want to do all of the cutting and pasting and and um, summarizing and, and chopping and transforms that you want. All we're going to do this stage is add to add column headers because that's something we're never going to get from HDFS. Once we're finished and we're happy with what we're looking at, here we're only looking at a sample. All right? This happens to be all of the file, but this file could be terabytes in size, obviously, or gigabytes in size. Um, and so we'd only be looking at a sample and just to kind of tell us what the structure of our file was. And once we're finished and happy with it, we're going to click this. And we click Apply and Close. Now, our file is small because we only want to work with a small piece of data for this demonstration and instructional purposes, okay? But um, even if that was gigabytes in size, there is, a, there is a model behind Power Query that allows you to actually scroll through all of that data and work with it as if you had it all locally here, okay? So that problem is solved. Otherwise, there'd be no point in letting you connect to an HDFS um, file store if it wasn't actually capable of dealing with large data structures. So let's close that down because we don't need that anymore. <clears throat> what I'm going to do now is um, I'm going to use some kind of visualization. One of the other great pieces of visualization that comes with the Power BI tools is this Power Map. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to pop open this Power Map. This will take a little. Um, this will take a little bit of time to get itself organized, depending on how quickly the uh, network is working. Okay, not too badly. So what it's going to do there is it's going to um, it's um, going to open up um, the map here, and it's going to say first of all what we've got to specify is specify a geography. Basically, it says which which of the columns in your data actually specifies the geography, the location of the thing that you want to, to map. And here it's our course, and the course isn't um, a country; it's kind of like it's the full address. So here we've got four courses. There it's popped up four courses here. But that's fine, so we're happy with that. We click on next. It says yes. If I map that column course and pretend it's a full address, I can get 100% of your data points in, so I'm happy with that. If you're only getting 50% of them or 25% of them, you have to go back and, and try and hint to um, Power Map where it's gotten stuff wrong. A good thing to bear in mind is that being, this is actually driven, you can see down here, it's driven by Bing. A good thing to bear in mind is if um, Power Map can actually map a location that you've got to some place in the US. It will by default, okay? And then, and that sometimes you'll see why you only get seventy-five percent of data here. It's because twenty-five percent of it is over across in the state somewhere. You know, oh, damn it, it's, over, it's across here. And even sometimes when it shows you one hundred percent, shows you one hundred percent, right? But only some of them are in the UK and some of them are else in the, in the US. And then you have to go back and amend your data to actually hint to um, Bing where you actually mean. But ours are fine, it's found our four courses. Here I've got Perth, um, and I can't remember what the other ones were. Um, Perth and Air and Aintree and Ascot, I think it was. York. York, was it? Do you know what? Judging by that, I think you're probably right. Yeah, I think you're probably right. It was York. Yeah, you're right. It was York and Ascot and Air and Perth. Excellent. 
So now what we want to do is we want to actually show some data, because at the minute all we're showing is the, the geography. What we want to, to show is the horse and the prediction. I'll close this down because it just gets in the way with this limit. And here now, instead of seeing a CSV file, okay, of just like, well, here's the horse and here's the courses and here it's working. Here we can see a nice map, shows you where the courses are. Um, if, I put, if I hover over there, it says this is the course, this is my prediction for horse one on this course. So I could be looking at all of the races in the UK which are running at 2.30 this afternoon. Okay, and it says, well, actually, if you're looking at Perth at 2.30, I think horse one has a 56% chance of winning. Meanwhile, in the 2.30 at air, um, horse four has got an almost 60% chance of winning, and you can see that. And that's a much better piece of visualization than just showing somebody a CSV file. Okay? And now with the abilities that Power BI have got, we can actually just use Excel to do the same visualization. So as Devs on the Microsoft stack were used to, to working with Excel for visualization. I mean, there are all all other kinds of visualization software that you can use with HDFS, but this is this is quick and neat and easy for you because everybody's kind of used to working with Excel anyway. And now you can actually connect Excel to HDFS and makes a huge um, a, a huge um, leap forward in the kind of visualizations we can do instead of just showing your business um, CSV files. Okay, so let's um, jump back to the. To the thing, to the slides, and I am pretty much done. Um, that is excellent stuff. Six minutes of questions to go, okay? So I've <coughs> timed that pretty much to the minute. Yes, sir? Did you say before that the output of each reducer is a separate file? Yes, the output of each. So the question there was, does the output, so when the question there was, is the output from every reducer a separate file in the output directory? And that's that question is yes. So when I showed you before, I showed you that part dash xxx file, there was the, there was the file with the five zeros and there was only one because I've only got one reducer. You will see one of those for each of the reducers that you've got. Bearing in mind that um, the number of reducers you have is the number, um, that, the number of entries in your key set. So everything that's keyed the same goes to the same reducer. So if you've got masses of data and, and you've got f keys, a key space of 50, then you're going to get 50 output files. But what you can do, of course, is because it's all the Linux commands, right? you just go into that directory and you just cut them all together. Right? So it's no big deal. It's, it's one line to sort that in. I just wondered why you can do that automatically anyway. How would it not? The reducers. Each reducer doesn't know about the other reducer. It's just, it just doesn't work. I suppose the name node, because the, the name node would know when the job is done. You're absolutely right. So I, I suppose you know, the name node could say, well, I know this job is finished now, so I'm going to go to the directory and cut them all together. But then again, it doesn't necessarily assume that you want them all cut together, because I mean, things like Excel can handle all those files, but what are you going to do, you know, what are you going to do with a terabyte file of CSV? Because bear in mind, each of those output is, is, is one of the things in your key space. So if you're looking at customers, right, each of those is, is your customer. So that's each of your customers. So you might just say, actually, I'll just leave them like that, and I'll bring, I'll bring out you know, customers A to M. Whereas if you can cut them together, you go, well, thanks very much. What am I supposed to do with that? You know, especially if you've loaded those files in as separate. Because remember I said, I could, if I point at a directory, and all the files in that directory have the same structure, I can just, I can just put the directory in. So there might have been 20,000 input files, and it could have come from lots of different places. Right? And if I then concatenate that into one gigabyte file and go, ha, ah, there you go. You say, well, thanks very much. What am I supposed to do with that? Yes, sir? Um, if I fancy writing my own data visualization in WPF, how do I connect HDFS to get the data results out of it? Yep. Okay, so the question there is, um, if we wanted to write our own visualization tool in WPF or, or something like that, how do we actually get a hold of the data? The answer to that question is there is a RESTful API that comes with that, and so you just call and through the RESTful API. So in that particular case, what you would probably do then is to go to the output directory and bring back um, a part file at a time um, to show it. You know. Or if you're confident that you can, you know, if you know you can bring it all back at once and bring it all back at one go. But the obvious thing to do is just bring back one part file at a time. But the answer to your question is there is an, there is a, a, an, an API, RESTful API that you can call to access that. Anybody else? What would you test your macro reduce software? How do you so if you have to write some test, of, I've been doing a lot of TDD and DDD uh, recently. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you test uh, all these things to have a lot of moving parts? So the question there is, how do you test that? Um, how, do you, how do you test your macro reducer? 
And that's that question is exactly the same. We're writing C sharp code. It's just exactly C sharp code, and so you know you can you can write tests for for the actual individual parts inside your algorithm just the same as you would normally. When it comes to actually testing, this is when you want something like HD Insight Emulator on your laptop. When it comes to actually testing it end to end, and then if you had a big if you had a big data file, it's like a gigabyte in size. Okay, you would just head that file and take the first ten rows or whatever and test that because if it works if it works on if it works on you know. Um, a megabyte of data, it's going to work on a gigabyte of data. It's exactly the same process, provided every single line is correct, of course. But then, of course, you, you have, you know, you have um, error handling inside that that'll, that'll ditch um, rows which, which don't match. But that's basically how you test it. First of all, you use the same TDD techniques as you would normally, just to test each individual part of your algorithm. And then once it's all working, you use HD Insight um, on your laptop to actually run on a small data set just to make sure it's all working. The last thing you do is just to write code and push it straight up to the, to the Hadoop cluster. That's the second most successful way of, of pissing off your um, Hadoop admin, right? Is to write code and, and just test it by shipping it onto the cluster. Don't do that. Okay. Okay, any more for any more? So what's going to happen to the uh, relational database if this becomes norm? So the question there is what happens to the relational database if this becomes norm? And the um, answer to that question is absolutely nothing. Um, it's there. There are two. There are two distinct jobs there. The relational database there is basically, you know, for for storage of of data. Um, you use a relational database, for example, when you're interested in both the data and the nature of the relationship between um, the data and your database. This is basically for number crunching large. Um, this is for number crunching large amounts of data to get aggregates out. I would suggest in exactly the same way is you don't have um, a, a TLP server um, and your reporting server as being the same server because every time somebody runs a report, right, your online your OLTP server side of things comes to a, a creaking standstill and your customers can't use it. Right? So in the same way as you make that partition there to say this is our OLTP server and this is our OLAP um, server, what you can do is it, it can maybe for some, for some purposes um, replace your OLAP server for actually doing the number crunching. The other thing to remember is this can work with any kind of data type. Okay? So you're not going to put, so this could be JSON data, it could be CSV data, it could be um, video files. Um, the, um, I think it was the Times, I think it was the New York Times, they did a big digitization job where they basically um, invested in a huge online cluster, pay as you go on Amazon Web Services or something like that, and they digitized their entire, um, their, their entire backdated stock over something like a week, or maybe even have been a weekend, and then closed the entire cluster down and said, thanks very much, we're done with it. Okay, and that's not the kind of thing that you can do, obviously, on a, on a relational database. But there are tools, like, as I said before, like Scoop and things like that, which will help you extract data from a database. So um, HD, um, HDFS and Hadoop and all the rest of it isn't there to replace, it's not a storage mechanism, it's not there to replace your relational database server. It's very much there to solve the problem that I demonstrated at the start of the session. So there is no competition? Absolutely no competition as far as I'm concerned, absolutely not. I don't think there is anybody out there advocating replacing SQL Server or any other RDBMS with, an, with, a, with a Hadoop cluster. I don't think anybody is saying that. Um, I've never come across anybody um, who said that that would be a good idea. I certainly don't advocate that. How would you solve this problem before Hadoop? Before you have so how was this problem? How was this problem solved before we had the Hadoop framework? And in much the same way as I described at the top um, of the session, um, it, it was split out into map and reduce functions for scalability issues, and then of course the scalability problem was was solved. And Hadoop very much came along because after the scalability problem was solved, everybody realised that the actual the other problems that came with it were a right pain in the ass, right? But up until that point, you know. I guess it's the same as any other DevOps does just now. You know, the scripts to do this and scripts to do that, and a script to monitor to see if this was working, and scripts to shift this off when it didn't. And then at some point, somebody went, "This is a ridiculous idea. You know, we should we should do something a bit more structured than what we're doing here." And then um, Hadoop. Came. Actually, the, the the birth of Hadoop came along um, because the guy who actually invented Hadoop was working on um, I think it's called Notch, which he thought would be an open source version of Google because you know. Wouldn't it be great if more than one person indexed the internet and could have an open source version of it? And then very quickly he realized that that was a ridiculous idea because he ran into the same scalability issues as Google did. 
and then he read the same Google papers that actually advocated the map reduce and said, yes, that's a that's a problem, that's a solution to my scalability issue. And then of course, he then had all the other issues and he went, oh, do you know what? I'd be far better working on something to fix these issues than working on my um, my open source um, index of the internet. And so actually Hadoop was, was born that way by necessity. Yes, sir? Is it much, much of a schedule to this kind of thing? So if you want to continuously analyze your data, yep. is there much in the Hadoop world? Absolutely. So the question there is, you know, is there is there job scheduling capabilities? You know, so you don't have to keep doing that one time. And the answer to that question is absolutely yes. There's um, there's mechanisms out there for scheduling jobs. And of course, you know, because so when I showed you that um, at, at the very simplest scale, when I showed you that um, streaming job there, I mean that was an actually an executable. I ran it by hitting F5, but you, that could be on your machine, right? So there's absolutely no at the very simplest level you can set up an AT command to run that job. Um, every day or, or whatever, but it needs whatever. Directories and all those uh, absolutely, it needs that stuff. To, it needs that stuff to, to exist. But within the Hadoop world, there are there are lots of um, scheduling um, uh, mechanisms out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Does Hadoop handle uh, an incrementally changing data set? Can you modify it? And it will just rerun parts of the data. So the question there is, does it handle incrementally changing data? Yeah. Um, so if you only wanted it to run a certain certain selection of the data, then instead of specifying the entire directory, okay, you'd have to have some way of, um, you'd have to have some way of specifying in a pattern which files within that directory had changed. So it doesn't do anything like. No, Hadoop won't. Hadoop won't look into. Hadoop will look into your files and see what's changed since the last time it ran the job and only use the data. It's, there's, there's no mechanism for doing that. Okay, so even if you have like 20,000 files to change one, it will run everything. Like yes, it will, it will do that. And that's, not a, and that's not a problem because it runs it really quickly. And if it doesn't run it quickly enough, then just double the size of your cluster. Or if that's a real problem for you, then partition that, that data yourself. So if it changes every hour, then you do a, a nine o'clock hour, you do a nine o'clock directory, a 10 o'clock directory, a 12 o'clock directory, and so on. So it's th up to you. There's no automatic way of doing that. But the ways in which you could solve that problem as a developer are, 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 are legion. Okay. That's actually after time. So people will be drinking your coffee and eating your stickies. If you do have questions, then please stay behind as I'm packing up and, and ask them. But other than that, thank you very much for coming and please enjoy your coffee. Thank you.